So moved. moved. It's been moved. Second. Second. That we return to our regular session. All in favor of roll call vote. Mr. Kane. Aye. Mr. Conwell. Aye. Mr. Brown. Aye. Ms. A. Aye. Staff requests that you approve resolution 21-103, certification of closed meeting. I move we approve resolution 21-103 as presented. Second. It's been moved and second that we approve certification of the closed meeting, resolution 21-103. Can I get a roll call vote? Mr. Kane. Mr. Conwell. Aye. Mr. Brown. Aye. Ms. A. Aye. You do the pledge of allegiance and invocation. Staff is requesting approval of tonight's agenda with two added items in closed session and two added items in open. One is resolution 21-106, the disposition of property. I'm sorry, there's just one added item in open. I move we approve the agenda as amended. Second. It's been moved and second. They will approve the agenda as amended. All in favor with a roll call vote. Mr. Kane. Aye. Mr. Conwell. Aye. Mr. Brown. Aye. Ms. A. Stark. Aye. Staff is also requesting approval of the consent agenda. It consists of the minutes of the February 1, 2021 meeting, budgetary matters, warrants, and resolution 21-105, personnel matters resulting from closed session. I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. It's been moved and second. It will approve the consent agenda. All in favor with a roll call vote. Mr. Kane. Aye. Mr. Conwell. Aye. Mr. Brown. Aye. Ms. A. Aye. There are no public hearings this evening. We do have a couple of items with appointments. The first is Mr. Matt McLaren with Robinson Farmer Cox Associates. He's here to present the 2020 audit for the county. Hello, Matt. If you'll adjust the microphone, please. Well, maybe Debbie can help you. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Matt McLaren. I'm with Robson Farmer Cox Associates, and our firm performed the FY2020 financial statement audit. I'm here to, one, present the results of that audit, and two, communicate the required points between an auditor and a governing body. At this time, I would like to review briefly the required communications between an auditor and a governing body. The first of those required communications, the responsibilities under the audit. Management or the county is responsible for providing records sufficient for audit purposes for maintaining internal controls and complying with grant agreements and laws as it relates to financial reporting. The auditor is required to conduct audit tasks sufficient to opine on the financial statements, test those internal controls, and compliance with laws and budgetary requirements. The second item required to communicate are accounting estimates. Accounting estimates are a normal part of financial reporting. They are routine with just about any set of financial statements Common estimates of which are included in this financial report include depreciable lives of capital assets, estimates related to OPEC and pension liability, and uncollectible property taxes. The third item we require to communicate are difficulties encountered performing the audit. An example would be incomplete records or the inability to access records we would need to complete our audit process. 
please report there were no such difficulties. The fourth item required communicated correctly and uncorrected to the statement. As with most audits, there are proposed audit adjustments. If those proposed audit adjustments are included in the financial report, they're considered corrected misstatements. Adjustments that are not included in the financial statements because management was elected to exclude those are considered uncorrected misstatements. And please report there were no uncorrected misstatements for the FY2020 audit. And lastly, we require to disclose any disagreements we had in applying accounting principles. And please report that we had no disagreements in applying accounting principles to the FY2020 audit. That was briefly the required communication between an auditor and a government body. At this time, I'd like to review the financial report. I believe everyone may have a copy with them this evening. I will start on page one. This is the independent auditor's report. It's the first of three reports you'll find in this document. It contains the CPA firm's letterhead. This is the overall opinion on the financial statements and the material accuracy of the numbers presented. We've issued an unmodified or a clean opinion for the financial statements. And this is where we end in June 30, 2020. Again, that's on pages one through three. To briefly review a few of the key financial figures in this document, I'd like to start on page 14. This is exhibit three, the balance sheet. You'll see that the financial statement is laid out in a fund financial statement format. The first fund is the general fund, which is the county's main operating fund. And the takeaway from this financial statement, you'll see the total fund balance. It's a number at the bottom there. The total fund balance for the general fund is approximately $16.8 million. The unassigned fund balance, a component of total fund balance, is approximately $16.1 million. If you turn the page to page 16, this is the statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in the fund balance in exhibit five. This is very similar to a profit and loss statement or income statement for a for-profit entity. And again, you'll see the same fund layout there in the general fund, again, the first column. The increase or net change in fund balance is the third number from the bottom. So the increase in fund balance or equity for the year ending June 30, 2020, was approximately $4.25 million. I'd just like to point out real quickly, if you're kind of scanning across the page, you'll see the capital projects fund had a substantial decrease. It's very common in the capital projects type fund. Funds are issued or accumulated for capital projects or long-term projects that may cross fiscal years. So fund balance will go up and it will naturally come down. And that's what happened this year in June 30, 2020. If there's no questions, I'd like to proceed to the rear of the document. As I mentioned, there are three reports. You'll find the audit firm's letterhead. The second and third of those reports are found on pages 115 and 117. On page 115 is the independent auditor's report on internal control over financial reporting. It spans the course of one and a half pages. And in this report, we've disclosed no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in the financial reporting of the county for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2020. And lastly, the final report that we have issued is found on page 117. This is the report of compliance as related to federal programs. Any governmental entity that receives greater than $750,000 in federal funds is required to have what's called a federal compliance audit. We're required to issue a report that's found on page 117 and present that report to the Federal Audit Clearinghouse each year. If you were to read the one and a half pages that this report contains, you'll find that we've issued an unmodified or clean opinion for the federal compliance audit that we conduct. That concludes my remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions the court has at this time. Does anyone have questions for Mr. McLaren? I have no questions. No. No. If not, thank you for coming down to present. We appreciate it, Matt. I'll take this time just to thank management for helping us get through the audit process. It was a unique year, as you may imagine. I just want to extend our gratitude to them. Thank you. Thank you.
our thanks to the county for their service. You're welcome. The second item under uh, appointments this evening is Dr. Alton Hart, um, District Health Director for Crater Health Department. Mr. Hart, uh, Dr. Hart was asked to speak to the board tonight regarding uh, the COVID-19. And of course, this is all done with technology, so please be patient. Please bear with us, folks. Dr. Hart is not here in person, as you can very well tell, but we are trying to bring him up um, using um, a program that hopefully will allow him to give a PowerPoint presentation also. So while we wait to see if we can bring Dr. Hart on the line and here with us, uh, we can move to the next item on our agenda. Uh, we have a Black History Month presentation by Mr. Kane. You say Black History Month, I say Black History. Black History is every day, not just once a month. And what I'm going to do tonight is this is we're going to talk about Greensville. And of course, within Greensville, we're going to have to include Emporia. Because it was Greensville, and Emporia was a town up to 1967. Greensville County was a part of Dinwiddie County. In 1789, Greensville County was separated from Dinwiddie County and became Greensville. If we go back and look back at that period of time, in Greensville County, we had a doctor named Dr. Thomas Stewart. He was a medical doctor, and he was one of the first blacks to live in Greensville County after 1781. A free man and a landowner. And Dr. Uh, Stewart was able to charge 25 cents, I guess, that back in that day was a lot of money to charge 25 cents when you waited on somebody. And then we look at, when we look at the period right here, of delicate Peter K. Jones. Peter K. Jones bought land in the Hicksport District in 1857, elected to the House of Delegate in 1869 to 1877, represented the County and the surrounding areas. In 1867, he worked very hard to make sure that blacks could vote, and also making sure that blacks could get an education. But basically what happened during those times is this is we had to do most of our education in houses because there was no schools. In 1900, the Greenville County uh, Training School was open for blacks. A three-one frame building 
It was led by Reverend J.H. Waller, Georgie Kelly, and the principal at that time was E.W.I. The Belfield School Board gave $1,000. The blacks in the area contributed $500, and the rest of the community bought $1,900. And that's how the training school came about being our training school. In 1929, it's when the governing body took over the training school and made it a public school. So during this time, you know, we as the blacks was the one that was taking our funds to make sure there was a place for blacks to go get an education in. A local farmer named George C. Williams, he purchased a bus to transport county students and teachers to school. And uh, I'd like to add a note here when I was talking about EWI, and I'm sure some of y'all, I attended EWI as a black high school, and some of y'all might have attended as a junior high or even as a middle school. And I, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Wise's granddaughter, Miss Wise Owen Penn, and we was living in Petersburg, and she actually taught my daughter history during that time, back in the 90s. In 1953, 54, EWI High School opened, and the training school became an elementary school. Mr. Wise became the first principal, and the school was named after him, EWI High School. Samuel Wilbert Tucker, a black lawyer with an office in employee. He was one of the main lawyers in the 1854 case, Brown versus the Board of Education. He also worked on the Prince Edward case when the school was shut down for about five years because they didn't want blacks to attend the same school as the whites. And I had a pleasure, as a youngster growing up on Atlanta Street, well, Samuel Wilbert Tucker office was to go up to meet him and also to talk to him when he was in Greensville County. Garland P. Faison became the first black justice of peace who could marry couples, handle small claim court cases that was less than $10,000. He was also the first black elected to the Board of Supervisors. Joseph Bond, a local funeral home owner, a Bond's funeral home, was the first black elected to the city council. Wide Lee was the first black elected to sheriff. Linda Richards was the first black elected to the county treasurer. Linda L was the first black elected to clerk of the court. Mary Person was the first black elected to the male of the employer. And I'm gonna say this before I get myself in trouble. I'm speaking of elected officials, so somebody gonna try to tell me about first. And I'm talking about elected officials. And if I leave anybody's name out, charge you to my heart and not to my head, okay? Bessie Moore and Rhonda Jones Gillen was the first black to get elected to the uh, school board. Belinda A. Scrapp was the first black chairperson of the Board of Supervisors. Delegate uh, Rosalind Tower, I remind people of this because Mr. Uh, Peter Jones was the first black elected to the 75th district. Delegate Tower was the first black female elected to the 75th district. Uh, also, we had uh, Lydia Ramsey. She was elected to the first Commonwealth of Attorney, and she also serving as a judge. And I'm going to close my statement with this, using some words from the great Dr. Martin Luther King. He said, I prefer love because hate is too much to bear. He said, one day, this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creeds, that all men are created equal. And we will speed up that day. We all can join hands and sing the old Negro scripture. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. Thank you very much. So do we have Dr. Hart yet? All right, we'll move on. Uh, we have the added item uh, that was mentioned at the first of the meeting. It's resolution 21-106. It's approval of bids for the di disposition of the landfill equipment. Lynn, Lynn, whichever Lynn. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Uh, January 24th and 27th, uh, staff advertised for bids uh, for the sale of surplus property at the landfill. On February 10th, 
uh, you see here, so all of the, all of the huh. surplus equipment. Uh, right Out Equipment Company submitted a bid in the amount of $5,005 for the purchase of the Caterpillar Dozer. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, right Out Equipment also submitted a bid in the amount of $2,505 for the purchase of the surplus Caterpillar Compactor. And Rhino Equipment submitted a bid to trade us a 670B motor grader that he owns for the surplus 963 front end loader that we have in the landfill. Uh, after reviewing and evaluating the bids, staff has determined uh, that these bids to sell and or trade should be awarded to Rhino Equipment Company. Staff is asking your approval uh, of the attached resolution which authorizes the county administrator to execute the sale agreements after it is approved by the county attorney. Do you have any questions? Thank you. I move we approve resolution 21-106 as presented. Second. All in favor? We roll call vote. Mr. Kane. Aye. Mr. Conwell? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Ms. A. Star? Aye. Thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda is uh, citizens' comments. Anyone wishing to speak to the Board of Supervisors, please come forth. State your name and address at this time. My name is Ed Murrow. I live at 300 Cypress Lane. I've been a resident of Greensville County for almost 70 years. I'm here tonight to address some things. I was hoping Dr. Hart would be on before I spoke. I'm just wondering, is he going to answer questions or he's just going to give us a, what's he going to do? He was here at the request of the board just to give a presentation and he, they may have questions for him, but we're not going to, anybody have, here is not no, sir, we had not intended to open the floor. Okay. I got to say, um, when the pandemic first started, and they started talking about testing, we heard testing, 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 testing. That's the key. Nancy Pelosi stood up, testing, testing, testing. That's the key. And I, we were eating supper, my wife and I. We always watch the news while we eat supper. I don't know why, because it makes me mad every night. I don't know why I do that, but we do. And I looked at my wife and I said, <coughs> they talk about this massive testing. I said, that's not going to happen in Greensville County. Now, I know we've had some testing. But to be honest with you, I never heard from any county officials my supervisor or anybody exactly how I could get a test if I wanted to have one. I'm a little disappointed in the communication from the Board of Supervisors. This pandemic is the most catastrophic thing that's ever happened in my lifetime. I was not alive during World War II. I'll be 70 years old next week. So this is the worst thing in my life has ever happened to our country. So moving on, about the middle of this past summer, I can't keep my mask up, when it was announced that we probably have a vaccine by the end of the year, of course me and my wife, we were sitting there at the supper table, and I don't know why I do this, because it makes me mad when I watch the news while I'm eating my dick. And I looked at my wife and I said, hmm, that's great news. I said in Greensville County and Florida, it'll be two and a half years at least before we ever get vaccines. Now, I wasn't exactly right, but I was close because we're getting just enough vaccine so the Crater Health District can say they're giving us vaccine. We're getting scrapped. I did not hear anything from any of my, my supervisor about what I would do to register or make an appointment to get in line to maybe get a call 
from somebody or an email, I guess it's the Department of Health, to possibly get a date that I could set up an appointment to get a vaccine. And it may be days to weeks to months. We did go online and register. And that's, that's the reply we got. Now I know you up there don't really have anything to do with that. But I am disappointed in the lack of communication that the citizens of Greensville County have from our Board of Supervisors, especially in the last year. Putting the website up on the county website that comes from the Crater Health District and make it run in a little blurb on page three of the newspaper, to me, that's not sufficient. Everybody in this county doesn't get the newspaper and everybody can't work the internet. Everybody's got a mailbox, though. Most every house I ride by has got a mailbox out front. Now, I don't have any faith at all in this Crater Health District. I was really interested to see what this Dr. Hart had to say. But I pretty much know what he's going to say. He's going to say there's a shortage of vaccines. It is in Greenville County. He's going to say that the money, they don't have the staff. He's going to come up with all sorts of reasons. I was interested in hearing what he was going to do tonight. You know, we're going to set up a bank of phones now. We're going to have a bank of phones here, a bank of phones over there, and everywhere we're going to have a bank of phones here if we don't watch out. We just had a new website go online today, from what I understand. The governor was on the television. And he was just as, pre just as pleased with himself as he could be. Ask the question: is, is it 35 health district in the, in the state? Is it like 35, and this was going to tie them all together. Why wasn't this done in October or November? That's the question you need to ask, Doctor uh, Hart. Why weren't these phone banks set up in October or November? Why, why are we doing it now in February? Did they just all of a sudden realize they got two million doses of vaccines? Golly, we got to give these things out some sort of way. We got to get people registered. Somebody dropped the ball. That's why I was interested in hearing. I, I wish I could ask him the question because I realize y'all don't have nothing to do with that either. But I'm gonna tell you, if you don't watch those people, whatever they say, they have cut benefits. I don't know whether they cut benefits to Greenville County. It's hard to get information, but I know there was a, a program on Channel 8 TV. In Sussex County, our neighbors to the north. You know, the Crater Health District shut down their health department back in March and left a note on the door telling them they could go to Hopewell for service. Now, this is Kerr, and I don't know if any of you know this gentleman. His name is uh, Eric Fly. Anybody know? Y'all know him? He's a supervisor in Sussex County. And this is on Channel 8 now. I'm just reading basically the transcripts of it. I think that's disgusting. And they claim they took those personnel and moved them somewhere else to better handle the COVID pandemic. You know, Sussex is very much like us. A lot of elderly people can't do internet, can't do the online tele, tele appointments with a doctor. They don't have, I don't think they even have a doctor's office in Sussex County. Maybe they do, I don't know about it. If you don't watch these people, that's what they're gonna do to us. They're gonna talk a good game. But I don't have any faith in all of them. I don't know about you, you on the board, but I don't have any faith in them. You know, my, you can go to Greens, you can go to North Carolina, and Royal Gravis and get a shot from in Port of Virginia, a vaccine. Did y'all know that? My next door neighbors, lady down the street, went to Royal Gravis and got, a vac and got vaccinated for the virus. I shouldn't have to go to North Carolina. That's ridiculous. I know some people have been to Colonial Heights and got shots. I know one lady that's gone to Dinwiddie. I don't know how she did that. Got a shot in Dinwiddie. We can't get them here in Port. We get out, what, what, 80 shots a week? I don't understand it. That's what y'all need to be asking this guy. 
And he's going to tell you, we're short of staff. That's what he said in that Channel 8 news article. Well, you know, the United States Congress just passed a budget back, I mean, a bill back in um, spring of last year. It was almost $3 trillion. Billions of dollars in that bill for COVID. They passed another one in December. That was almost, I think it was $900 billion. Millions of dollars for COVID. The governor of Virginia, on the front page of today's Richmond Times Dispatch, I guess it's a miracle. He found 73 more million dollars to add to the state budget. And I will quote him. He says, Virginia's economy continues to thri thrive in spite of the pandemic. That's his words, not mine. Maybe he needs to bring some of that $73 million down here to the Crater Health District in Greensville County, Emporium, Sussex County, and Surrey. Surrey's in the same boat Sussex is. Uh, their health department is open one day a week. They, they, they got the same kind of community that Sussex has and we have. Just older, elderly people. Not a lot going on in Sussex County. And not a lot going on in Surrey. But he's going to tell you, and what he said, the response from the Crater Health District, from the spokesman, some lady named Banks, I think, was that they had a shortage of staff. You know, Sussex County threatened to cut the funds off to the Crater Health District. Y'all know that? Maybe we ought to do it. In fact, what it says in the article, this Mr. Uh, Flyer says they're looking at taking legal action. I don't know what that would be. But since they don't even have a health department, I mean, it's just crazy the way we're being treated. It's just like, it's just like the road, the highway repair money that we get. You know, sometimes we don't get enough money to fix a pothole. Now, would y'all agree with that? And if you don't watch them, that's what we're going to have. They're going to do just enough to say they did something. And that's about it. If you don't watch them, somebody here has got to take the leadership. I don't, I don't, I, they haven't showed me yet they could organize anything. If they'll wait until months into giving out vaccines to decide to come up with some sort of registration website, that's way too late. That's a good tale about what, how they're going to have. Now, I know, that, I know the country's not swimming in vaccines, but I, don't, I have not read or heard that the state of Virginia actually ran out of the vaccine anywhere. It's going in Northern Virginia. It's going to the Richmond, Petersburg, uh, that area, Chesterfield, Gooseland, Henrico. It's going down to what I call Tide Waters, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake. I guess it's just coincidence that those three localities are the localities and areas that decide every state election when election time comes around. I guess that's just a coincidence. I don't know. But I tell you, I, I'm, I'm not satisfied with a lot. I know you can't work a miracle. And if you got 330 some million people to give a shot in the arm twice, I know that's a tough job. But I just feel like we are getting the scraps like we do on most everything else. Anybody have any questions of me? No, sir. I thank you for your time. I hope you take what I say in the spirit in which it was given. And I think Mr. Hart needs to answer some hard questions, especially concerning our area of the world. There's not a soul in this room, I would bet you money, that hadn't lost somebody to the virus. I had it six weeks ago, I had it. And I can tell you, I don't want it again. I didn't have to go to the hospital, but I can tell you, it put me right on my butt, I can tell you. You don't want it. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, is Dr. Hart ready at this time? So, we have no audio. All right, Mr. Owens, can you uh, go ahead and give us our COVID-19? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hold on.
Okay. I wanted to be sure no one else wanted to speak. I'm sorry I didn't make a last call. If there is no one else, Ms. Owens, could you give your COVID-19 update? Ms. Oh. Parson, I think you got somebody else that wanted to speak. Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't see you, sir. Come forward. Can you, can you give me the road name one more time, sir? What's the road name again? Boyd's Mill Road and Allen Road. You said Boyd's near Boyhead? Yes. Can, can I address this? I mean, this is my district, and I've talked to Mr. Acre about it. And uh, I've actually had conversations with VDOT, and we've had the regional jail pick up trash. We actually met with... Uh, management from Boar's Head to address it, but we're not getting anywhere. I've actually asked Ms. Parson to look at, see if we could hire individual mm -hmm. independent contractors to pick up trash because it is getting out of hand. Right. It's not just food wrappers and bottles, it's bags of trash and things. Yeah. So, and actually it's a problem that we're having throughout the whole county right now because I've called several times myself about areas that are in my district that just, it, it's ridiculous, and I agree with you. It's embarrassing. So that, that's something that we yeah. definitely, definitely need to We're working on it. We need to do something. Continue. We're, we're working on it. You know, people visiting the county, and, you know, it's embarrassing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, please. Thank you. Thank you. Update on Dr. Hart. Can you hear me? Uh, is that you, Dr. Hart? Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Can everyone hear Dr. Hart? I yes. can hear you clearly. You yes, can sir. Proceed. You can proceed. If you dare. Dr. Hart, we can hear you. You can go on and start.
times during our meetings with senior leadership in our agency. However, after the state received the open letter, our Commonwealth began moving in that direction because of increasing demand. And so during that same week, the state defined who would be included in Phase 1A and Phase 1C. Phase 1B was eventually redefined to include individuals 65 and older, individuals 16 to 64 with high-risk medical conditions or disabilities that would place them at greater risk for poor outcomes due to COVID-19, along with frontline essential workers. Originally, Phase 1B included those 75 and older, along with frontline essential workers. So once the state announced that the Commonwealth would be moving to phase 1B, the vaccine rollout became extremely challenging. Only 11 health districts out of 34, 35 were prepared to move to phase 1B at that time. And that's because many of them have very large health systems that were assisting with the vaccination efforts in their health districts. And most districts, uh, like Crater were caught off guard with this sudden expansion to phase 1B. So um, we were just not prepared to move our eight localities to phase 1B. However, we had to move to phase 1B. So we, I know there may have been some uh, misinformation or confusion with regards to communication because we initially communicated that we would move to phase 1B on February 1. And I felt that this would give us a little bit more time to shift our plans and to adjust. However, residents heard that the Commonwealth or other districts had actually moved to phase 1B, and as a result, our call center was flooded. Uh, and one, in one district, the phone system actually crashed. So this sudden expansion to phase 1B did not allow us ample time unfortunately, to update our website to provide clear guidance as well as address other technical challenges such as those related to registration. For example, I know there have been numerous concerns and complaints regarding VAMS, which is the Vaccine Administration Management System, which is a CDC system. And VAMS has a number of issues. Uh, VAMS is primarily an employer-based system that allows points of contact to actually put their employees in the system to get them vaccinated. So this sudden move to phase 1B did not give our district ample time to make the adjustments to accommodate individuals 65 and older as well as individuals without computers or access to the internet. And this was common for many of the health districts across the Commonwealth. Also, the sudden move to 1B did not allow us time to actually expand our points of dispensing or our clinics to accommodate all of our localities equitably. And as stated, it, were, it was never our intent to, to have local residents or underserved communities actually travel to Greenville County outside of their localities to be vaccinated. Um, in addition, I, I know uh, some have asked the question as to why other districts are vaccinating more people than Crater. Well, one reason is because Crater Health District does not have, unfortunately, large health systems like Ballard or systems like VCU assisting with the vaccine rollout. The bulk of the vaccines that arrived in the state actually went to healthcare systems and not the health departments. And so health systems like VCU have administered thousands and thousands of vaccines, and we have not been so fortunate. Also, the availability of vaccine is another issue. Uh, the state is receiving a limited number of vaccines, and, and Virginia has been receiving only about 105,000 doses of vaccine per week. So each, each health district is receiving a certain allocation of the vaccine based on a formula. And the amount uh, of vaccine a district receives uh, is based on the population of the entire district. So the population of the Creative Health District is about 155,000 people. And so this 155 is about 2% of the total population of the Commonwealth. And so you'll see on this slide here the breakdown of the populations for the, for the Creative Health District. And so those percentages are used to determine the allocation of vaccines um, across the district. Now, the current plan is for us to use, so we're getting both now the, the Moderna and the Pfizer. So the 
plan for us is to use the Moderna vaccines to continue vaccinating individuals in phase 1A, like group homes, along with those individuals 65 plus uh, in phase 1B. And as I just shared recently, we have been receiving the Pfizer vaccine and have been using these vaccines primarily to vaccinate teachers and staff of the seven school divisions in the Credit Health District. Uh, we were not able to get the Pfizer vaccine early on uh, because of the ultra-cold freezing uh, that it requires. And so we were just able to get a freezer maybe about a week or so ago. Uh, most districts have had those freezers on back order. We ordered our Pfizer freezer last year, and so they've been on back order. Fortunately, there was a health district that received or had an extra ultra-cold freezer, and we were able to acquire it. So thus year, we've been using the Pfizer vaccine uh, to vaccinate teachers and staff in our seven school districts, uh, school divisions, and we actually started vaccinating our Greensville County teachers and staff on February 6th. And so we were scheduled to continue our vaccinations with teachers and staff this past weekend. However, all of our vaccination clinics were postponed due to the weather and have been rescheduled for this upcoming weekend. So to help address the call center challenges I mentioned earlier, the state is launching a statewide pre-registration system. The Virginia statewide pre-registration system is now live and anyone who lives and works in Virginia can go there to get information about COVID-19 vaccines and to pre-register for a vaccine. So if, if a person is already pre-registered at the local health department, um, they do not need to do anything. Uh, they are already um, on the list, and, and that's a great thing. And if, you want to, if a person wants to confirm that they are pre-registered, they can do so at vaccinatevirginia.com. I'm sorry, vaccinatevirginia.gov. Here are some resources, um, additional information. So as I shared, uh, prior to the state rolling out its pre-registration system, call system, we had reached out to all of our local government partners to try to expand our call center because we recognized that this was a huge issue. We were getting, as I said, hundreds and hundreds of calls, uh, thousands of calls, and so it just really overwhelmed our system. And as I shared, we were not prepared at the time that the transition was made to 1B. And so now with um, our local government partners, as you can see on this screen here, um, there are call center, local call centers to help with the, um, the volume of calls that have been coming into the, to the district. And so um, I think this will be helpful um, going forward along with having the state call system. And I believe the, the governor is planning to do a press conference uh, tomorrow to talk about this pre-registration system even more and then to provide additional uh, information with regards to a number to, to call. <clears throat> so I'm sure um, that uh, you have a lot on your board agenda for tonight. So I will, I will stop here. I know you have a lot of, of questions, so I will do my best to, to answer answer your questions. Dr. Hart, it's been brought to our attention. Uh, as we all know, a lot of uh, residents don't have computer access, availability to see websites. Uh, we advertise in local papers, but they don't receive that. Is there any type of mailing that could be sent to all residents? So I think uh, I, heard, I heard what you said in terms of residents not having access to computers. So one of the, is, is that correct? The, the sound is a little bit muffled. That's correct. So I think that's what I heard. Okay. So with the good thing about the, the call center, the state call center, and having the local call center, given the fact that in a lot of our communities, particularly our rural communities, uh, people just don't have access to computers or the Internet. So over the phone, once you get a call center person on the phone, they will be able to go into the system and put that person's information into the pre-registration system and actually get them onto a wait list. So that has been a huge issue, and we've heard that complaint a lot, and I recognize it. I get it. I know that there are definitely issues with 
access to computers and the internet and in our district and particularly in our more rural areas and and it's just not our district it's across the commonwealth so i think that that issue obviously kept coming up quite a bit over and over and over again and so to help all of the districts this is the effort that has been put forward by the state uh, not only just to answer the calls but to also um, I try to accommodate those individuals who do not have access to to the internet to get them in the in the pre-registration system so that they can get on the wait list so that they can then move forward to getting an appointment to get their COVID-19 vaccine. But even with the call center, how do we get that information out to the general public? Is there that's what I say? Is there any type of mailing or anything that we can send to the general public? Put in every mailbox. So, yeah. So one of the things that we've done, in addition to at the local district level, creating our call center with our local government partners, we also created a Crater JIC, a Joint Information Center. And so that Joint Information Center is involving all of our local government partners so that all of our local government partners can get information out in a timely manner. And so that JIC, that Joint Information Center, well, each locality will work together and, and, and determine the best strategy to get the information out to the community because we recognize that one size does not fit all. And so we want to make sure that we're getting the information out uh, that's, that's tailored best for that community. So we recognize, I recognize that there are nuances. And so this joint information center We'll work with all of our local government partners to get that information out to, to individuals. So for some, it could mean uh, putting a mailer in, in the utility bill. So that might be the best strategy uh, for certain communities. For others, it may be putting it in the newspaper or, or our newsletter. So we, our Joint Information Center, will work with each locality and, and determine a strategy that's best suited for, for those localities. So we're definitely working on a plan to make sure that everybody gets the information. So I appreciate that question. Okay, I have a question. Uh, I've been getting people, um, they'll call in and I need to know what are the information that they need to get registered because some people are saying all they're asking for is just a name and a phone number. And I've seen the register where they ask for more than that. What does it take to make that register completed? And they'll be sure to get a call back. So it's, it's collecting more than just a uh, name and address, if I, I think if I heard you That's correctly. Correct. So it's, it's also collecting date of birth because we want to make sure that we're able to get to our citizens who are 65 and older. It's also asking questions about uh, chronic medical conditions because, as you know, those individuals with underlying chronic medical conditions are at greater risk uh, for um, poor outcomes due to COVID-19. So it, it's collecting more than just name and address. Absolutely. Well, I don't have someone to call, and that's all the registered person have asked for. Will they still be uh, contacted with just that information? I'm sorry, say that one more time. With, with uh, the information, well, it may be done differently now, I don't know, but I've had people to say to me all they been asked for is their name and just telephone number. I understand it's supposed to be their birthday address, email address if they have it. So will they be, um, in other words, if the form is not complete, they will not get a call back. So you're asking if, if the form is not complete, I think that's what I heard you say. Correct, correct. If yeah. the, if it's not so registered. all of that information is, it has been merged together from my understanding, and they're still working out the, the, the issues with it. It just went live today. And so they are, are still working on that and, um, as of today, and hopefully we'll get all these, all these issues will be uh, resolved very quickly if there are, if there are 
um, issues with contact and things of that nature. But my understanding is if people are already have been on the list, they will be on the new list as well. Um, even if it's not all of the information, I think I'm hearing you say that was not initially uh, collected. So right. all of that, I believe, will be sorted out. Okay, thanks. I'd just like to ask the question, with more vaccines becoming available, will there be any plans for mass vaccination sites in our area? I think I heard a question about mass vaccinations. So, yes, so that that is our plan once vaccine, vac vaccines become more available, we do want to have large vaccination efforts. Um, I don't know if you've caught uh, in the in the media that uh, Delegate Air was able to work with at the state level and and there will be a mass vaccination clinic um, this coming Friday in Petersburg just just for full transparency. Um, and so we we I've asked for additional uh, asked for additional vaccines because I want to make sure that we are able to have mass vaccination clinics not just in one locality or for or for two or three localities. I want to make sure that we are having uh, mass vaccination clinics in in all of our localities, including Greensville Emporia. I've already reached out to, to Delegate Tyler, and I've had a conversation with her with regards to our plans in terms of having a large event. And I'm preparing to, and I have a meeting scheduled with Dr. Uh, Delegate Brewer as well. So I want to make sure that we even, I know I showed you the slide that provides uh, the breakdown by population. Um, and that's unfortunately the way we're, we are, are um, uh, directed to allocate the vaccines. However, I want everybody in the room to know that I am advocating for more vaccines for for this district and 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 trying to make sure that everybody um, can be a, can participate in a large in a mass vaccination effort. So I appreciate that question. And so that that definitely 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 is something that we are wanting to do. And I think I just have one more follow-up question. There have been a lot of people saying that people from North Carolina have come over here to get shots, as well as people from here have gone to North Carolina to get shots. How are we going to streamline it where the people that actually live here are the ones that are getting the vaccines? I don't think we should be going across state lines for vaccines. Yeah, great question. And trust me, we've had a lot of conversation about that. And that's been a challenge for us here in the in, in the Crater Health District in terms of people coming from other districts and taking up slots and spots in, in our clinics. And because of the way the system has been set up, the VAMs, we did not know that that it, it was very difficult to to stop that from happening, but once we were able to go back and look at the data, we realized that people were coming from out of out of our district and taking up our slots. So we're hoping that, and, I, and I'm sorry I didn't share this in my in my presentation. So we have we're in the process of moving away from VAMS and moving to a new system called PrepMod. They're still working out the kinks in this system because part of the challenge with them, and it seems to be the same issue with PrepMod, people can take the link, and, and that's what was happening with VAMS. People can take the link, and they can send it to anyone outside of the district, and they can get an appointment. Well, we also discovered that the link that's provided with this new system allows for the same thing. So a person outside of Greenville and Poirier, outside of the Creative Health District, can get the link and register for an appointment. I know that there were people coming down from Richmond uh, to, to get vaccines and, and our neighboring districts coming over to Crater and getting uh, vaccines. And so once they correct this issue with PrepMod, ma'am, I, I believe that issue uh, will go away. But they're working on it. And so what we've been doing a lot of lately has been, and it's, it's required a lot of work, we've been doing a lot of our 
our uh, registration processes by, by paper and, and not sending out those links. Now, because we had so many school divisions when we started our vaccination efforts with the teachers and staff on the 6th, we did send out links to the school divisions. However, we were very fortunate to be able to have the superintendents to vet those lists to make sure that the individuals on those lists were actually their teachers and staff. Outside of that, it's, it's been very difficult. But my, again, my understanding is that they're working out that situation with the new registration system. The prep mod system is more geared towards um, getting the, the community vaccinated. Again, it's still an electronic system, and that's why it's, it's going to be really helpful for our citizens um, to call in. And the official call-in number will be released tomorrow during the governor's press conference. That's my understanding. So the number that people will be able to call to do the pre-registration process will be announced during the governor's press conference tomorrow afternoon. That's my understanding. So hopefully that will get, get us through some of these challenges that you are raising. And, and trust me, we've had a lot of conversations about that issue. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Dr. Hart? If not, we thank you, Dr. Hart, for your presentation and for responding to the questions asked by the board members. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Alton Hart. Is now exiting. We'll move on then to the COVID update from Mr. Owens. Good evening. Good evening. The COVID briefing for today is uh, is centered around the same theme that I. I have every week, and uh, the, as of this morning, Crater hadn't uh, hadn't provided updated information, and I usually like to use the Crater District information, but I, I included one that was uh, put out on the eighth of eighth uh, of uh, February, which was the afternoon of our, our last meeting. But I looked on uh, USA Facts instead today to get, get my update. And according to facts, Greensville County had a total of 1,419 positive cases reported since we began coverage last year on positive cases. All right? they, they also had 18 deaths reported, which was up one from our previous report. Uh, the city of Emporia had 609 co uh, positive cases reported, and they had 35 deaths reported um, that were COVID-related. So our community has over 2,000, there's 2,028 positive cases reported, and a total of 53 deaths due to COVID-19. Um, these numbers represent one of the largest per capita in both positive and deaths that there is here in the state of Virginia, all right? Now, as we speak, uh, good to have some light on the subject. Uh, as, as we, as we, we're having this briefing now, concurrently we're running a vaccination clinic right, right next door, right? And, and we got uh, people that are receiving first doses and we got people that are also receiving second doses where we were vaccinated several weeks ago. And, the, um, these people are in group 1A and 1B like Dr. Hart just re referred to, all right? Um, now, staff has numerous calls on how to register for the vaccine, and this information has changed uh, several times since we started the vaccination clinics. It's kind of a fluid process. Um, as of today, I got information about a call center that that was put out that Dr. Hart talked about. It's now the state 
call center so people can call the, the number and get referred to our call center in Dinwiddie County and talk to a person over there, or they can call another number and they can talk to the, to the state operators and put their number on the list there. And what staff does is we post that on the county webpage, we post it on Facebook, and uh, both at the Sheriff's Office Facebook and the Independent Messenger nice enough to put it on their Facebook, and we also put it on the Chamber of Commerce. Recently, we sent out code red messages providing call center information. And I would encourage citizens, if you haven't signed up for code red, you're missing, you're missing out on a great opportunity. You can receive phone calls, you can receive text, and there's also a mobile app that you can put that tracks your phone. So, so if you would take time to look at the county webpage, all right, and just research on and look at all of the, the options that Code Red has, that's a service that the county pay, p provides um, that you all fund. It's a way that we can get word out to the most people the fastest, all right? Um, I think there was some conversations about the best way to, to get the information out, and, and I'm open to suggestions. I know the mailers, uh, we've tried mailers before. Um, everybody doesn't get a water bill or anything, so, you know, it's a, it, probably a combination of all the media outlets, all right, and, and, and hopefully word of mouth, uh, passing the word at your churches, that you, you know, that you attend and things like that. All of those are great ways of communicating this information that's out there for people, right? And uh, the, the, you know, on the registration, and I think Dr. Hart touched on that, once, you're, once you put your name on the list and you go on the list, putting your name on the list three or four times doesn't increase your odds of winning a, a ticket to get a vaccination. They, they're going to screen it by age and by medical condition, and they have that criteria set up in the selection system. And Crater Health District is the one that runs runs that program. It's not county, it's, it's not emergency services, it's not board of supervisors, all right? Now, staff did support Crater Health District on Saturday, February the 6th, and we vaccinated everyone that signed up in the Greenville County School System at that time for COVID vaccine right here in this room. That was our first test of having, having a vaccination clinic set up in this big room. It worked great. We pushed about 200 people through here in a little over two hours. And again, we weren't using computers. We were doing the paper part. And I think that, pro that process helped it move along good. That was our pilot and test so that when the vaccines do become available, our plan is, is to have the Golden Leaf Commons as a, as a walk-in. If the, if the weather, weather keeps us from being outside, we can set it up in here, and we can push three, four, five hundred people through here in the course of a day-long vac vaccination when the vaccines become available, all right? But that clinic runs just as smooth as anyone I've seen, seen done that day. My hat's off to all the school uh, employees that volunteered, uh, the people in the community that came in and volunteered, the nurses and the people with registration, uh, post-registration, and the good thing was when those people left here that day, they already had their appointment. It's like our clinic's going on now. They had that second appointment confirmed when they left the building, and that's a big improvement over when we first started, and Dr. Hart mentioned the VAMS or the VAM system, and that was a little bit too too complicated for a lot of people to navigate. So hopefully prep mod it's going to be easier for people to get in and take advantage of it, all right? And we, staff, still work, is still working with Crater Health District to streamline the vaccination process, all right? Uh, we, we're, we're able to vaccinate more people in the same amount of time now, so as the staff becomes available, the volunteers are used to how the flow works. It seems to be flowing a whole lot better, all right? So, 
staff also continue to remind the Department of Health, all right, that we are one of the unhealthiest communities that there is in the state of Virginia, and hopefully, hopefully, the state will allocate more vaccines to the to create a health district earmark for Greenville and Emporia in the future. Are there any questions? I'd just like to make a comment. Uh, I would like to see some type of postcard mailer sent out to current resident mailboxes with the code red numbers, the call center numbers, and the websites to make sure that we're reaching everybody. As, as Mr. Lowe addressed us earlier in citizens' comment, I think we got a lot of people out there we're not reaching, we're not communicating with. And we need to make that effort to do that. And what I'll do is I'll reach out to the city of Emporia. And the, and the reason it kind of needs to be a combined effort is if you deal with a, the with a mail system, you know, a lot of people live in Greensboro County have an Emporia zip code. Right. A lot of people that live up towards the Purdy area, they may have a Jarrett zip code. We also have people from Sussex County with a Jarrett zip code. Skipper goes actually into the edge of North Carolina and things. So, so what we can do is uh, we can work with the crater public information people as far as letting them draft up the language on the flyer concerning the vaccination process, you know, who, who you call, how do you register, and that type of thing. And we can, when I say we, uh, both the city and I can work with Code Red, and we can make sure that we have that link and things on there so that people can actually go in and register for Code Red. And like I say, if you don't have that mobile app on there and you, you're an iPhone type person or whatever, that mobile app follows you anywhere you go. It gives you the current location updates plus back where that phone's logged into. All right. Thank you. Well, we can work on that. Anything else? All right. Thank you for your time. I'm going to get back to the vaccination clinic. Thank you. Staff, recommend you adjourn. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we adjourn. All in favor with a roll call vote. Mr. Kane. Aye. Mr. Conwell. Aye. Mr. Brown. Aye. Ms. Aistra. I'd like to have a motion to go into record section with Warden Seward. So moved. Second. Roll call. Mr. Kane. Aye. Mr. Brown. Aye. Mr. Conwell. Aye. Ms. A. Stroud. Aye. I'd like to have a motion for the approval of the agenda. I move we approve the agenda as submitted. Second. Roll call. Mr. Kane. Aye. Mr. Conwell. Aye. Mr. Brown. Aye. Ms. A. Stroud. Aye. I'd like to have a motion for the approval of the consent agenda. Move we approve the consent agenda is presented. Second. Roll call. Mr. Kane. Aye. Mr. Conwell. Aye. Mr. Brown. Aye. Ms. A. Stroud. Aye. There is no public hearing. The item was, a, was appointment. We have Mr. Larry Moody will be present to request an exemption from the uh, rules and regulations of the GTWSA. Uh, so, if Mr. Moody, so if you can. Uh, good evening. I just wanted to give you <clears throat> some information regarding Mr. Informa Mr. Moody's request. Mr. Moody previously had an appointment before the Water and Sewer Authority on November 2nd of 2020. Mr. Moody requests an exemption to the Water and Sewer Authority's rules and regulations. He requested your approval to convert his account from an unmetered sewer user to a sewer non-user. The authority requested at that meeting that Mr. Moody have his septic tank inspected to verify that it was functioning properly and then return to the authority for a decision regarding his request. The Virginia Department of Health inspected his septic system and found no deficiencies. A copy of that septic inspection report is attached. The authority also directed the staff to verify that Mr. Moody was not connected to the system. The result of our inspection determined that Mr. Moody is not connected to the authority sewer system. A copy of the staff's November 2nd, 2020 report is also attached regarding Mr. Moody's account.
January 1. Good evening. Like I said, I'm here to get your consideration again. Like I said, I've met all the requirements I think I had to do. If there ain't any more, I would like I would do them. But when I paid my fee, like I said, I all thought it was just for water, but I found out later for sewer too. And I got booked with sewer. I don't know how or why, because my wife held my bed at the time. But if you can see it in your heart, to get me on the non-user fee, I would sure appreciate it. I have, um, this is going to go to the county attorney right here. I need a, a clarification. It says the water collection fee will be $250 if paid by January 31st, 1995. I remember that because at the time they came through me. But the question I have is says after that date, it will be $500. So I would assume that his fee should be $500 because it after January 31st, 1995. So any, so this date, any date after that date would be this date, any other date, so this date is coming after that date. I need some clarification on that. There was a period, Mr. Kane, when a discount was given to encourage people to connect voluntarily. And that discount period elapsed and the full fee is imposed. So as I understand your statement, I agree with you. Okay, because what you're saying right here, it said hereafter. So it was 250 at that time. So hereafter, he should be paying $500 for the connection. I believe you're correct. Okay, so he, he should be, if he wanted to cook up to the water, he should only have to pay $500. That's so this said hereafter, and this is hereafter. That's a different question, I think. Could, could you repeat what Mr. Kane said? I'm sorry, I didn't hear him. I said, it says, it says, it says, the water connection fee would be $250 if paid before January 31st, 1995. I agreed with that. And then it said, after that date, it would be $500. Agreed again. So, the fi so if he wanted to hook up to the water, he should only have to pay $500. I thought so, the gentleman was already hooked yeah, up to the water. Already no, he's not hooked up to the water. Okay, I did not understand. Right, so, so this is here after. So if, if he wants to hook up to the water right now, his fee should only be $500. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Water is not available at this Right. The answer to Mr. Kane's question is yes, but it's not available. So, uh, so, so we're saying you, we're saying he can't hook up to the water. Yeah. Yes, sir. Water is not available at Mr. Moody's residence right now. It would require a minor sewer, minor water extension, for him to be able to get water service. But, but wouldn't that been the same thing? Whatever you had to do now, when you had to do it back in January, uh, back in January prior to this? Connection fees, sewer, sir, are based upon the cost of the Water and Sewer Authority to complete the connection, so that we recoup the fee. The fees in 1995 would be much lower than in 2021. But you said, but this said, uh, he, he, I asked the attorney. It says after that date it will be $500, and this is after that date. And what you would have done, if you, if you, whatever you would have done prior to January 3rd, 1995, the exact same amount of work you got to do right now. So that's no difference. So he should only pay $500 because they said after that date, it will be $500. So you can't charge him more than that because this is the language that we're going back. It said after that date, and this is after that date. So the only thing he should pay is the $500. Yeah, I'll say something. Oh. Right. Because uh, if, if you if you'd have hooked him yeah. up, and if, if you'd have hooked him up at that time, you had the same exact work. At that time, it's the same work that we got to do right now. That's I think about two years ago, I tried to hook up to the water. Mm -hmm. They told me it cost me about $4,500 right. from pipe from that side to my side. Yes, sir. That's because the difference. But the only thing he should, the only thing according to what you, what you gave him, and it says January 30th, 1995, the only thing he's going to pay is the $500. Because that's what was, that's what this state. After that date, it would be $500. And you only go by what you put right here. So that's what he has. He says after that date, it's $500. So he has the right to hook up to pay the $500 because that's what this state is right here. Um, may I again? The, it's true, but it's only true if the service is available, and it's not available at his house. Right, Mr. Gibson? It, it would require a minor extension. Okay, but wasn't it, was it available at the date? If he had paid the $250, was not it available at that time? No, sir, it was not. It would have required a minor extension. So, 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 okay. If he had paid the two fifty at that time, then what would have happened? The water and sewer authority would have done the minor extension. We okay. You know how much it would have cost you. before nineteen ninety five with but the two hundred fifty? But it's still the same thing now. It's the five hundred. It, 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 there's no difference. The only difference now is still him paying the two fifty. He paid the five hundred dollars. That, that's no difference. 
That is the exact same thing because what you stated right here, you said after that date it would be five hundred dollars. Okay. This is after okay. that date. Let, let me step in right here. Being that we're, water really isn't a question right now, and the only thing he's asking is about his sewer service. He's never been hooked up to the sewer service. He's never had our service. So it is my um, request right now that I move that we um, grant Mr. Moody his exemption request. I second that. Roll call. Just sewer. No, no. It's, uh, look, this is what this... Uh, his request is asking correctly, us just is, for sewer. Correct me if I'm wrong. It says after that date it will be $500. So whatever they got to do now at the 250 is the same thing they got to do right now. So you can't go back and change the language. You well, can't ch what we have in front of us is just sewer. Of what I'm reading is just no, no, sewer. Wait, wait, wait. Go over here. This is, a part of, this is a part of what was sent to Mr. Moody right here. This is a part of what was sent to him. And this needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed. <clears throat> so what we're doing right now is this is we're looking at, at the sewer and also and in this part, it, 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 when I got my package, it came in my package. The water connection fee would be $250. And we was talking about, you, you're saying about the steward, but right here, they put in here the water connection would be $250 if paid before January 31st, and after that date, $500. And this is after that date. So only thing he pays is the $500, because this is definitely after that date. He, it was $250 prior to it and $500 right now. And I don't think we would, we would be fair to Mr. Moody and fair to anybody else for us to go back on our word. But this, in 1995, I wouldn't hear. So what are you requesting right now? Huh? From what I see here, just the sewer. Right now for the sewer. Right. Just for what? The sewer. Yeah, but, but what I'm trying to say, this is, but this is also. Now I use the fee. Okay. He, had, he had came for also, he had, he had, the, the sewer part came up, but he had asked for water. So this is addressed right in here. If you read it, if you want to go to it, it this is what we read. So. They put this in, I didn't put this in here. When I got this packet, this part was put in here. The water connection fee would be $250 if paid before January 31st, 1985, and after that date, $500. It was in 1995, that was way before I came here. So I can't see how we can treat this man unfair based on the language that was put here in 1995. So if he decided to hook up to the water right now, he pays no more than the $500, because this is what this says. And whoever put this together, I wasn't here when he put it together. But we can't treat this man unfair. That's what it says, five hundred dollars. And if he hooks what? up to the water, he pays the five hundred dollars. What do you think? And that's why, the, that's why I asked the that's why asked the attorney was I correct in my statement. He said yes. Yeah, now he's gonna amplify if he may. The uh, Mr. Moody has a specific request. Ms. Astrop made a specific motion that granted his request. So there is a motion on the floor to grant Mr. Moody the relief he requested. That is a motion, and that is what the board should vote on. The motion Ms. Astrop made. Before I proceed, then, uh, that's why I asked you the question. Am I correct in my, in my statement? There are two different issues, but Ms. Astrop has made a motion to grant this gentleman the relief he requested, and Roll that, call. that motion should be voted on. Aye. 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 Now, how do I proceed now, then? Since this was in this, this is in the language that was sent to me about the water. And that was one of his requests. So now I don't think this this is what it says. Do you have a copy of this? Do you have a copy of it? No, sir. Okay, do, do, you want me to bring it to you so you can see it? No, I'll be glad to see it, yes, sir. Mr. Moody, are you requesting water at this time? No, I wasn't requesting it, but, uh, but I had planned on hooked up like that about two years ago, but told me called me fire card. $4,500 bill was. I bet you no longer want water, correct? I mean, I didn't do it. Do you want, do you want water? Yeah, I want it because I got Thank that you. hard water act. Like I said, when I paid the two bills, that's what I thought I was paying for water. But like I said, if I don't know what I paid for two, I don't know. I didn't take care of the bill, my wife did. And she can't answer now because she's been sick for the last 10 years, so. Mr. Gibson, is water available in Mr. Moody's house? Not without a minor extension, so Okay. A if minor water, water extension. Would that minor extension be made by the authority? It could be done by the Water and Sewer Authority. I believe this way this was priced by Mr. Clements was with the contractor. But I'm not 100% sure. I, I would need to research But that. are you saying under the authority's policies, if he wants the service, 
He pays the cost of making that service available to his property? Yes, sir, our okay. connection fee. Okay. So it is a $500 fee if it's available. And to make no, it available, our, he's got to pay the contractor's cost to get the service there. Is the that correct? The, the connection fee has changed a lot since 1995. Okay. That's $960 is the connection fee now. But with a line extension, typically the, con the, the contractor's cost for the line extension or the water and sewer authority's cost, if we can do it with our maintenance department, is what Mr. Moody's connection okay, fee I'm, would I'm be. I'm trying to keep this simple. Mr. Kane has correctly pointed out it's 500 You have said that the fee has gone up from that to 560 correct? 960 960 Couldn't hear you. Okay, but that still depends on the water being available. That's right. And, and you're in, saying that the authority could determine the cost of that and let Mr. Moody know if he wanted to pay the availability fee and the connection fee, he could connect. And this was never intended to be forever. These rates change over time. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, well he's, he's grandfathered in, so this... Well, you don't get grandfathered in. There, there are timelines on all these programs. The, the 250 had a, a date after which it was not available. The date was the 500. The 500 was available until the authority changed its rates, and that apparently has happened several times. And, 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 and yes, that's it, correct. If it's after that date, it didn't say about anybody changing anything. If it's after that date, it would be $500. Okay. And, and the same thing about the authority. Nobody changed anything. Okay, so the issue is Mr. Kane thinks since it said 500 after this date, right. that was perpetual and could never be changed. And the practice has been in the authority to change the rate to reflect the cost of the authority. Let me, let me explain to you something else. Sure, I would like to. I came on at the same time. Yes, sir. And what I did at this particular point in time is this is, the same people could see. Three years later, I never hooked up with the man. Yes, sir. Okay, so when it, when it came back in, it, it, the, the, the hit after date meant that whatever that, because I didn't hook up in 95, so when I hooked up in 98, I only have to pay the hit after date. Okay. okay. Yeah. I, I, there was nothing telling me at that time that when I came back in to hook up for the water system that I had to do, do, do anything different. So right now, any date after January 31st, 1995, any date, whatever that date is, it could be 2035. He still pays $500. So it, it didn't say anything about any authority. It didn't say anything about anything else. All right. The, I think this is the issue. Mr. Kane is pointing to that and saying, because it said after this date, 500, Mr. Cain believes that is a, a fee that is fixed in perpetuity and can never be changed. I think the authority's practice over the years has been to change rate to reflect increase in cost. Is that correct? That is correct. And so the cost have increased from 500 to 960. Yes, sir. And that has been the policy of GCWSA forever. Yes, yes sir. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> the only argument I got, that, that, that's what it said. It should have been stated right here. That's not what it said right here. It said here after. Well, let me let me ask the question. Uh, uh, okay, uh, the, uh, that, that could be a motion on the floor for that. They said after that date it would be five hundred dollars. Like I said, they put it here. I didn't, and I know when I did at the same time, I just had to pay what it was in the hereafter. Okay, now can I got a motion for that from somebody? I like to make a motion on it then. Uh, that Mr. Moody paid the five hundred dollars. I made a motion. Roll call. We can do a roll call. I don't need a second. Okay. Are we doing the roll roll call on the first vote and second? First, right? We, we already did the first one. We did the motion and the second, but we didn't do the roll call. Huh? We did the motion. I, I thought when, we, when when he was here for the sewer part, we already did that. Okay. We did that. Okay. Everybody voted. And that's when we came up with this. Everybody okay. Voted. So uh, voted yes on that. the motion there is the $500. Right. Mr. Kane? Aye. Mr. Conwell? No. Mr. Brown? No. Ms. A. Stark? No. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. So move. Roll Second. call. Mr. Kane? Aye. Mr. Conwell? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Ms. A. Stark? Aye.